Good morning. I'm Jason Corey, and welcome to another episode of Talking Tech. I'm here today with uh, Kent from Missouri and Trevor Quinn with Red Hat. And we're here to talk to you about a very exciting concept and technology called microservice architectures. So today we're going to talk about some of the differences between something that a lot of people have heard of, which is called service-oriented architecture, and what some of the differences are with microservices. So as usual, we're coming to you today from Red Hat's public sector headquarters in McLean, Virginia. And the goal of these sessions, this is a reminder, is to cut through the fluff and make sure that we talk about how emerging technology is relevant uh, to our government clients uh, across the country. So with that said, Kent, will you, will you please introduce yourself to the audience, give a little bit of your background? Yeah, my name's uh, Kent Udy. I'm a technical director at Missouri. I've uh, been doing microservices for the past couple years um, as an evolution from the service-oriented architecture that we've been doing for 10, 15 years. Great. So. Thanks. Appreciate you joining us. Trevor Quinn. I am the PaaS and DevOps practice lead for Red Hat Consulting North America, and I lead a specialist group that just uh, focuses on container platforms and microservices application architectures deployed on container platforms. Uh, across the country, works to harvest best practices and uh, kind of uh, standard modes of, of implementation, capture those and, and make sure the rest of our customer base can benefit. Great, great. So just, we like to start everyone out with just a foundation of, you know, what is microservices? So if somebody asks you that at a client site, uh, Ken, how do you typically answer? Well, you know, some people say microservices is contrary to service-oriented architecture. I like looking at it as an extension or an evolution of service-oriented architecture. Um, the same principles still hold, but then it, it fixes a lot of the problems that were there in service-oriented architecture, like the large ESBs and, and unwieldy configurations and, and scalability issues. Um, so it, it, it breaks that down into small, um, reusable um, components that now you can scale um, individually or you can manage individually, so it gives you a lot more flexibility. Okay, great. What about you, Trevor? How do you usually answer that question? Yeah, um, you know, small, uh, individually, independently deployable uh, application components uh, that are that are self-contained and, and exposed through lightweight, uh, normally HTTP-based APIs. Um, that's that's kind of the name of the game. And, and as Kent said, the, the independence of those components is really important because it has a lot of ramifications in terms of how do you manage large-scale deployments of that architecture. Okay. So before we dive into some of the technical differences between a SOA and a microservice architecture, can you, can you talk about some of the organizational change that sort of prompted the move to microservices? I think as, as I've read about microservices, it strikes me that businesses that are really uh, undergoing significant change and are trying to do things quicker have moved to these types of architectures to have you know a more cohesive team that might include like a UI person a database person and you know a, a business logic person on one team versus having them be be siloed so um, and, and if you've got any examples of, of what you've seen in different clients, uh, Kent, that'd probably be a good start. Well, well obviously, um, the big thing is Agile and Scrum is, is, a, is a big factor in this because you're, you, you want to be able to deliver things um, quicker. Um, and DevOps is the other key, word, you know, key to this. Um, you're, you're now um, you're deploying lots, lots and lots of deployments, so you need a good um, CI, CD pipeline and, and ways to deploy these services as opposed to the old traditional way of doing things. Okay. So you'd basically have this monolith application that you'd break down into individual components. And would it be safe to say that each of the, those componentized services would be developed as a product like by a different team, so instead of having a bunch of people working uh, in unison in something like you know, exactly, Scrum. and then and, you know, and your your people that that you look at that have succeeded at this, like your Netflix and some of the people like that, um, they in, empower a the, a person, a developer that's responsible for that service end to end, all the way to production. So it's 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 just changing and flipping how organizations hand things off to production because the same person's responsible for it from the start all the way to the running in production. Yeah, yeah, and I think anyone who's read about microservices, it's kind of hard to miss the Netflix, you know, component of of how influential they were and really driving a lot of this. Um, Trevor, any observations you've you've made and just sort of some of the things that they did in, initially and then how that's you know, gone out to the mass markets uh, in term microservices? I think the main thing that, that Netflix has helped to popularize is just the notion of rapid, uh, frequent cadence of software delivery. So just the notion of being able to um, propagate 
frequent changes to code, push it out to production rapidly to adjust to, to changing market needs, and just being able to kind of understand and monitor that large-scale deployment so that they can be responsive to changing conditions in the underlying uh, infrastructure or changing conditions in, in the usage of the platform. So I think microservices is really, it's, it's kind of an application architecture that is aligned to the entire kind of philosophy of frequent cadence delivery of software. The more you break down your application into these smaller components, the easier it is to push out those individual changes because you don't have to ship the entire application with that feature okay. release. So I think being back to sort of the original question, which is what are some of the differences? So when I hear microservices versus SOA, I, I still hear the word service, right? So I think it's safe to assume there's still services involved. Uh, but what are some of the other differences? Like I, you mentioned earlier about large ESBs being used predominantly in, in, in service-oriented architecture. So how's that different from microservice architecture? So, so in your traditional SOA, um, you would buy an ESB, you deploy that ESB, and you would deploy your individual services on that ESB. But if you needed um, more scalability for an individual service, you have to scale the entire ESB infrastructure. You can't just scale independent services. Um, microservices flips that around and you have lightweight components that can be scaled individually um, and deployed individually. Um, even maintenance, um, if you needed to do a patch, um, because of a particular uh, service, you're affecting every service that's running in that ESB infrastructure, where microservices can be scaled, they can be patched, they can run independently. So, one of the things that I've always used as a good uh, educational point is Martin Fowler's um, article on microservices. And one of the ways he describes it is you're moving from having a lot of the intelligence built into the transport layer with a service-oriented architecture and an enterprise service bus, into having your endpoints be a little bit more intelligent and the pipes being a little less intelligent. So I think that's where we've seen a lot of clients at Red Hat uh, be interested in learning more about messaging technology uh, specifically because they could have an endpoint with very finite uh, discrete APIs and then a very solid messaging bus to, to, to actually interact in how that application talks. Is that something you've seen? Uh, uh, yes, and even, um, even a, a level above that, I see Camel and Fuse and BPM used in a microservices architecture as a way of orchestrating um, across your microservices architecture. Got it. So it's possible if you have a service-oriented architecture today, you're not throwing it out and moving to microservices. It's more you're starting now to augment that with microservices, would you say? Yeah, I think it's important that we don't kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater, if you will. Like, there are a lot of really good uh, Java enterprise technologies that were available to the, to the SOA world around things like transaction management, messaging, um, uh, object relational mapping to the, to the database, business rules management, all of these things need to find their place in a microservices world. Even though we don't have the same XML-based schemas and, and standards, there's no reason why you can't start to weave some of those same frameworks and, and enterprise uh, supporting technologies into a microservices architecture. Because ultimately, uh, applications are still having to do the same kinds of operations. They're still reading and writing to and from a database. They're still writing to storage. You know, they're still uh, participating in, in transactions, things, things like that. So if I'm an agency CIO and I have uh, a bunch of old applications and now, you know, all these vendors are coming in talking to me about microservices, how does that influence my legacy environment? So do I have the ability to, you know, augment my legacy app with some microservices on the front end? Or how would you recommend I start to go from where I am with some real old transportation logistics type systems to trying to leverage uh, microservices? Normally our model is to recommend that, that people do kind of an incremental migration, start to find pieces of the monolith that can be broken off and, um, and stood up as a separate kind of microservices, kind of uh, standalone um, uh, deployment beside the same in-place application. And then as you get more comfortable with deployment processes and, and modes of developing in that paradigm, start to shift um, traffic for that particular component over to your new uh, microservices deployment and then incrementally shift more and more of the application over into that um, new deployment environment over time. So it's not kind of a uh, flip the switch, you know, um, big bang kind of approach where you're migrating the entire application and not delivering any value while that development is ongoing. You want to move it over bit by bit, piece by piece and get more familiar with that 
new architecture, new deployment process as yeah. you go. And then Kent, what about at the integration layer? So um, instead of deconstructing the, the app, is there a good way to put a integration layer on front of some of these legacy applications? Uh, yeah, I mentioned before. Um, so. Um, and some applications we would um, developing for clients, um, we, we see BPM as a good uh, orchestration tool to, to be able to do a, a larger business process because microservices really are small. Um, you, d you do want to be careful the, of the nano service um, paradigm that's an anti-pattern. But um, since these microservices are responsible for doing very small, discrete things, you, you, you may have a long-running um, business transaction that you need to orchestrate. And products like Camel um, and the Fuse um, can, can orchestrate that. Or BPM is even a better tool because it gives you um, some persistence and some um, visibility into um, reporting on these business processes. Kent, Trevor, thanks so much for your time today. As usual, we like to keep these educational series short. Uh, we've got an upcoming one on DevOps, and we've also had an episode of Talking Tech on containers that mesh very well with this microservices discussion, so we encourage you to listen to those. Um, you can always contact us anytime at talkingtech at redhat.com. And if not, we'll see you on the next episode. Appreciate your time. Thanks very much.